It is essential that we have restored to the body of Jesus Christ the gifts, the Holy Spirit, in order for God to fulfill his purpose. And these things are not just arbitrary things that we can have or not have as we may choose, but they're absolutely essential. The charismatic walk and power is essential to the continuing life, effective functioning of the body of Christ. I want to continue along that theme tonight with a passage from 1 Thessalonians concerning the need this hour of your receiving the deeper word that God is is bringing forth, the bread that is breaking, uh, how that we need to prepare our hearts to receive the deeper word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, because you see it's not enough to just to have the spirit without the deeper word, we'll just dissipate the power and not fulfill God's will. You know you can dissipate the power of the Spirit and just praise and shouting? <laughs> yes, you can. That's what the Pentecostals have been doing for a long time. They've got the power, but it's all going up. None of it's going out and performing the ministry that God intends that should be conducted in this end time, that he's preparing us for. Paul says, verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all. Making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and the labor of love and endurance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. Verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only. Now we emphasize the word and the importance of it, but Paul says that we need more than just the word, the letter of it. So our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. You see from verse 5, the apostle informs us that it's possible to receive the message that's coming forth in this hour in one of two ways, either to receive the word only or to receive the word in power and in the Spirit. And when we receive the Word as we should, these three essential elements, aspects, will always be present. We'll not just be receiving the Word, because every Christian has received the Word, or he wouldn't be a Christian. But when we receive the Word as we should, we'll receive the Word and the power and the Spirit. The Apostle Paul also speaks of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. So you don't have to be a great orator to be a great apostle. And my speech and my preaching, now his speech is the word of God. You see, and we could translate it, and the word and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and in power. So there again, we see, as he said over in First Thessalonians, that the word of God is to come in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. And when we receive the word, as we should, in the demonstration of the Spirit and power, then it's going to affect a change in our lives that will be so dramatic that both you and others are going to know something's happened to you. I mean, many of you here could give already give a testimony to that, even though your friends, your family, sometimes wives or husbands do not agree with your charismatic experience. How many of you could testify, well, they've said, he's changed. I'll say one thing, she's different since she received the Holy Spirit, which I don't agree with, but I'll say one thing. Uh, those charismatics are always praising the Lord and full of joy, and they don't know defeat. They don't have sense enough, maybe, but they don't know what it is. <laughs> and they know something's happened. I remember several years ago when I returned to Louisville, the place where I did quite a bit of my early preaching before I became charismatic when I was in the Baptist seminary. And uh, now I had the baptism when I was back in a Baptist church and just putting out all the stoppers and telling about the miracles and the tongues and the whole bit. And it was reported to me by another, well, by the pastor, because he had heard what was said 
of one who, a friend of mine who had heard me before, a non-charismatic, and who had heard me this time after he'd received the Holy Spirit, and he said, he said of you, said, well, he's different, and then he went on to say to the one he was talking to, I'll tell you one thing, he's got a message. Now, he never said that before, because you don't say that about Baptist doctrine. But when you receive the Holy Spirit, when you receive the Word and the demonstration of Spirit and power, they know that something has happened to you. Now, I was speaking in a Christian church a few years ago, and 35 or so received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was non-charismatic, and they asked for the message that we have here to be brought there, and several received the baptism, as I say, 35 or 40. And uh, went out to lunch one day with the pastor, with a friend of his who was a pastor of another Christian church. And all the pastor did of the church where I was speaking was make announcement and lead the singing. I was there doing the teaching and preaching. But this pastor, a friend of his, had gone to seminary with him. Now, the pastor, by the way, was charismatic where I was speaking. And he had five or six in the church who were when we went there. But the pastor, who was his friend, said, I just can't get over the change in you, what's taking place. And all he was doing was announcing some songs. He hadn't heard him preach, but he could see that difference. Why, he said, you're the one in the seminary that couldn't even put a sermon together. You're afraid you wouldn't graduate, running around trying to get us to help you so you could get out of here. Afraid of your first pastor and all that. He says, well, look at you now. He said, well, I gotta, I've got to have that. He said, I, my church is dead. I'm dead. And so forth and so on. So they know when you receive the word and spirit and power. You see, it's possible to receive the word without the power because you neglect to receive the spirit. The power is in the spirit. But you see, lest we charismatics feel that we've arrived, you can also have the spirit without the power. Because you do not permit or allow the Holy Spirit to fulfill his ministry in you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, my friend, as we've said so often, as we carefully discuss in the Deeper Life book, Deeper Life in the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not an end. It's just a doorway, a threshold experience. And so many, many charismatics are at the same spiritual level they were when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people are receiving the baptism, but not all are growing in the Spirit. They're still at the same level spiritually. They still have no faith. Hearts are filled with fear and doubt and anxiety and unbelief. And they're just about the same spiritual level as they were. They're still spiritual babies. Uh, they can't receive the deeper word that comes here in this ministry, for example. If they have a choice between a deeper word like this and going to hear somebody's testimony of how they got saved or baptized in the Spirit, they'll always choose the latter. I've met so many of these people, it's very discouraging, if you allow it to be, uh, to be around people who are satisfied with stopping at Pentecost. As one woman said to me, she said, after sitting under this deeper word, she said, I personally, and she was not criticizing those babies who are charismatic babies, but she said, I no longer have the time or the interest just to run around to hear people tell and do things they've been telling and doing for years. You know, hear a testimony. And there's a place for that, for people who need to get saved or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or people who are new in the charismatic walk. But there must come a time when you begin to hunger and thirst after the deeper things of God, or His purpose is not being fulfilled in you. And to stop at Pentecost, and some of you are on the verge of doing that. Oh, dear friends, I know some of you. Bless your hearts are on the verge of stopping and being satisfied with going to work, going to your business, and then coming here for an hour or two and being preached at or two and entertained by this beautiful music that you just heard, and just stopping and settling down, you see. And it isn't that there isn't a place for the testimonies and the, the beginnings and all of that of the charismatic experience, but you should be dissatisfied with just a diet of the milk and not the strong meat that God wants to give you. Amen. This sister wasn't criticizing these people who are not moving beyond Pentecost. She was talking to me, someone she knew would understand. She didn't get up and make an announcement and say, you're a bunch of babies, and why, why, do you keep, why are you so satisfied with just running to a meeting now and then, a charismatic meeting where somebody's going to give a testimony, or you watch them pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. 
Now, as I've already said, and I'm not going to keep saying it, that is a beautiful uh, meeting and is essential, but we must get beyond the place where that is enough to satisfy us and to desire the deeper things of the Word. And so you can have the Spirit and not have the power because you're quenching the Spirit. You're not growing in the Spirit. You're hearing the Word, but you're hearing just the Word. You're not hearing the power. You're not having the demonstration of Spirit and power operating in your life. Some who have the Word, who have received the Word and received the Spirit, still do not have the power because they're trying to fit their charismatic experience into the old denominational system. And they're, they're losing the new wine. You see, Jesus said, you can't put this new wine in old wine skins. I'm going to tell you, if you're still wedded to some of those old denominational churches, you're still wedded to their teaching and their beliefs, which is contrary to everything you have received when you receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, you see, uh, if you try to fit what God is saying and doing today in the context of the denominational system, you'll just quench the Spirit. You'll lose the new wine which will not go, Jesus said, into the old wine skins. Like one woman said to me, I've been sitting in this denominational church, spirit-filled woman, for nine years, drying up. Nothing's happening. She came to one of our services. why she got stirred up to say that. <laughs> she saw the difference immediately. She said, why would God want me to stay in a dead church like that. I said, Sister, God doesn't want you to stay in a dead church like that. I said, that's the devil's work to rob you of your effectiveness. And that's your testimony. You've been ineffective nine years, drying up, dead spiritually. You see, she'd received the Word and the Spirit, but she had no power because she was putting the new wine in the old wine skins and losing the new wine. And so we've got to receive more than the Word and more than the Spirit. We've got to receive that deeper Word that God is bringing forth to the end-time saints. You see, every saint is waiting to be caught up. Every, every Christian is waiting to be caught up, you know, to the marriage feasts of the Lamb, whether he's Spirit-filled or not. They're all waiting for that to happen. But I find astonishingly few Christians, Spirit-filled or not, have the slightest notion as to what is required to participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Institutional church Christians thinks that's enough, being a Christian. Most charismatics think that's the answer, think that is the answer, you know, to receive the Holy Spirit. But the Bible shows you much more is required of that. Revelation chapters 2 and 3 says you must overcome. says it seven times. You've got to overcome to participate in that. Revelation 19, 7 tells us that the wife, now we're his wife already, but he said the wife made herself ready and she was caught up to the marriage supper. Oh, I'll tell you, to be his wife is not sufficient. You've got to make yourself ready. You see, because of the great trials and tribulations and the cost involved in overcoming and heeding and obeying such a, a stern word that Jesus gives us in this end time, to die out to everything is the message, to overcome and everything is the word, to die out to Christ so that as he died so that the living resurrection power and life of Christ began to be manifest through us. That's too much for most charismatics. And they're not going to go on to perfection. And they're not going to be caught up. Now, I'm not even getting into the realm of what's going to happen to them, but I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to anyone that isn't caught up. He's going to be here when the tribulation comes. Non-charismatics are going to go through it. I believe charismatics will be will we'll be preserved through it, but I don't have a verse of Scripture for that. I'm just being optimistic. But the ones who are going to be caught up to the marriage supper of the Lamb are going to be those who made themselves ready. And just ascending to certain, uh, just ascending to the Word, the dead letter of the Word, Paul says the Word, the letter kills. It's the Spirit that will give life to it. Just ascending to the Word in the letter only are, are saying, I believe in certain truths that are coming forth from this pulpit or that are in the Word of God is not sufficient for you to prepare yourself. Just receiving the baptism without the deeper Word is not sufficient for you to prepare yourself to be ready to be caught up to the marriage supper of the Lamb. By the way, those are the ones that are going to be brought back in this great end-time ministry during tribulation that the Lord is showing to the Spirit. When the institutional church is going through the tribulation, overcomers are going to be here ministering. They are that army that our brother was talking about. 
The Lord has shown me the same thing, except in a sermon by prophecy. Gideon's army. I may preach that again here sometime. Gideon's army, that God is preparing us. And it's just 300. It isn't the 30,000 that he started with. It's those who prepared themselves and made themselves ready. Amen. And so just having the baptism without the deeper word won't, won't bring about the fundamental changes that are necessary for you to prepare yourself to be caught up. There's going to be people who have sold out, who have gone all the way, who have overcome in everything by faith through the Spirit. You see, you can take the invisible gas or gases in this room, hydrogen and oxygen, condense it, and you can get a liquid called water. You can freeze the water and you'll get ice and you can put a fire under it and melt it, melt it, get a liquid again, evaporate it, get a vapor, and then go back into invisible gases. Many changes, but you see, in every case, there was no fundamental change that was had taken place. And that's precisely where institutional church Christians are without the Holy Spirit. But that's also where charismatics are without the deeper word, who've stopped at Pentecost. In both cases, all they've got is a lifeless sort of Christianity that leaves a person about where he was when he began. You see, the word without the spirit has no power. But the spirit without the deeper word causes charismatics to dissipate their power in shouting and praising and getting together and testifying, which has a place. But that is the evidence of the baptism, not the purpose. That just results from the baptism. It isn't the end, the purpose. And Paul speaks of this deeper word over in Hebrews chapter 5, if uh, you want to... Uh, Note that with me. The fifth chapter of Hebrews speaks of a word that, that we are admonished to get a hold of and not stop with just the basic elements of truth. He says in verse 12 of chapter 5, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one should teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leave the first principles of the doctrine of Christ. He doesn't mean give them up, but quit standing on the promises. Act on them. Therefore, leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ and go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we'll do if God permit, but he says to go on to perfection. That's the deeper word. To have the power, you've got to have the spirit and that deeper word. It isn't enough to have the word. And the Spirit, but it's a strong meat of the Word of God that He's trying to prepare you to eat and to digest. And it's coming to you gradually, a little here and a little there, and as you can assimilate it, He's going to give you more. There's much He wants to show us, but Jesus said you can't bear it yet. It means you can't handle it. <laughs> you can pick it up and run with it, but you wouldn't know what to do with it. It's just the meat is too strong for... Uh, you can get into areas right now that uh, the average charismatic, what we take as, as first principles of faith around here, the average charismatic stumbles over. It's the first time he hears it. Sits with his mouth open, doesn't know where to say amen or say he missed it or he's a heretic or something else. This, when you quote the plain truth of God, that all things you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Just a simple promise like that. The average charismatic cannot handle because he stopped at Pentecost. He's got an experience he doesn't know there is anymore. But God, with this deeper word, is preparing us for the greater works ministry that is coming. Greater works, as we mentioned last week. And for the perfect faith realm that he wants to bring you in. He isn't satisfied with your faith, my faith, anybody's faith in this hour. It's the faith of Jesus, the faith of God. Mark 11:22. we must have, and that's perfect faith. That when we speak the word, it happens. Whenever we pray a prayer, it comes to pass. Because it's a perfect faith, and he wants to bring us into the realm of mature sonship. And that's why he's sending forth the deeper word for the greater works ministry to prepare us for it. You can't handle that ministry without the deeper word. 
and to prepare us for the perfect faith realm because it will all function by faith. And to bring us into maturity as the matured sons of God because in spite of what some are afraid to say, I am not, Romans 8 says he's going to manifest the matured sons of God to this creation. It's going to be delivered by the sons of God. If you're a son of God, don't be ashamed to quote the Bible. It's Romans 8 because some have gone to... If one extreme on it, don't go to the other one like most charismatics and be afraid of truth. Because God can't manifest a son who doesn't believe he's going to be manifested. He wouldn't be prepared to be manifested because he has to believe it now to get ready for it. And this greater works ministry that he's preparing us for, mentioned over in John 14, it wouldn't hurt some of you to look at that. I quoted it hurriedly last week in the message we gave and said that every Christian says he believes these promises, and yet down deep in his heart he says, would it really be possible if I tried to apply it? Or would it really work for me? But John 14, 12 to 14, this is one of the greatest promises to the church in the Bible. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. Do you believe on him? Amen. Then quit saying, quit saying he was talking to the apostles. Or to the first century Christians. Or to the Jews. Or those who lived in Palestine. Or to the future out there. He said, He that believeth on me the works that I do, he shall do also. And then this that so many can't really receive, not by faith, and greater works than these shall he do. Greater works. Because I go to my Father, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Why? So the Father will be glorified in the Son. You ask it in his name, that glorifies God to answer prayer, the prayer of faith. Quit thinking you have to beg and plead with God to do what he says. It glorifies him for you to believe him in Jesus' name to ask him. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Why do you limit God? Find out what he said he will do. And all he said he would do is included in that anything. But the greater works are yet to come. Joel 2 speaks of an early rain and a latter rain. And the Lord is showing by His Spirit how the early rain in Joel chapter 2 speaks of the present day outpouring. 1900 to 1975 at the present time. 75 years of the early rain. But there's a latter rain to come. And the early rain is described here as the works that Jesus did. But the latter rain, which is to come, is the greater works ministry that has, why, the half has not been told. God is revealing by His Spirit to His servants all over the world, uh, servants you know and some you don't know, how that the book of Acts and what happened there and the things you're seeing now and the things you saw under ministries like Oral Roberts and T.L. Osborne, William Branham and so forth, these are but a drop in the bucket to what he's getting ready to do through you, if you believe it. Because we are the ones upon whom the ends of the ages have, have come. And you know those of us who can take it by faith and believe it because it's already in the Word. There it is revealed. The greater works have never been done than it's going to be done. They will be done through us. Hallelujah. I believe it. That means I'll receive it. Hallelujah. God forbid that I should doubt. But by the Spirit of the Lord I shall shout the victory and claim by faith that I shall walk in that army of Gideon. Yea, I shall be one of them, and I shall perform the works of Jesus, yea, the greater works that he promises in his word. In John 14, 12 to 14, I spoke that with the Spirit. But it was still a confession of faith. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Amen. Oh, I mean to tell you, friends, eyes not seen, ears not heard what God is getting ready to do through you, through those who overcome, who those who are not satisfied with the status quo, with stopping at Pentecost, with their little job or their little business or their little... Whatever it is, it's taking your time and your interest. But these are just means to pay the way to learn the Word and prepare yourself 
for end time greater works ministry. I'm not going to stress the works. I'm going to stress the greater works because they are to come. The works are happening already. The works of Jesus. If you don't know that, you're not charismatic or you're not a part of this work or you've never heard some of the greater ministries of this century. And some have erroneously thought they've, that they had seen the greater works when they saw such tremendous ministries like William Branham, T.L. Osborne, Oral Roberts, F.F. F. Bosworth, Jack Cole. But these were the works of Jesus they were doing. You see, there's a few instances, there are a few instances in the New Testament, Book of Acts and so on, where the dead are raised. But the dead are being raised now. Branham, I've heard him tell of five times that he raised the dead. You see, that's not the greater works. Those are the things that happen right here in the New Testament. But the greater works of, say, raising the dead, that's just one area that God's going to demonstrate the greater works power of the end time matured sons of God, would have to be an increase in number and degree. I can conceive of the time in the Spirit when whole churches will be martyred, when the great tribulations, and I mean, don't mean the great tribulation, but the great tribulations and judgments and uh, are coming upon this world and upon this nation. And when the world church is established, and when you can't meet and worship like this, and when you'll take your life in your hands as you do behind the iron curtain many times just to meet, they can never have a service like this. Persecuted, put in prison, killed many times. I can conceive of whole churches being martyred and the matured sons of God under such anointing walking into the midst and saying, Arise in the name of Jesus. And the whole body rises up before the awe-stricken gaze of the persecutors. These are the greater works that he's going to demonstrate in this end time. And hallelujah. Well, I can, I can tell you believe it. And Jesus raised Lazarus dead and stinking four days in the tomb. Why, to do that would not be the greater works. He says, you'll do what I do and greater works than me. And if the Spirit revealed to you he's going to raise up someone not dead four days, but four weeks, four months, four years, four centuries. What if he told you he's going to raise up John Wesley? come back and preach, or a prophet. Could you handle that kind of revelation? If you, if you can't, you're not ready for the greater works ministry because things like this are going to happen. I agree, I agree with one prophet of God who said if God told me he's going to raise up George Washington tomorrow, I'd call the whole world to witness it and put the skeptics on the front row. <laughs> Hallelujah. I would too. <clears throat> I, I believe in letting God be God. Have faith in God. For whosoever, and that's what you are, if you're in Christ, the whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and I doubt his heart, but believe those things that he says will come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. The greater works ministry, there be such an anointing, will be transported. God is revealing by his Spirit how that, just like Philip, that we'll just be caught up in a way the ministry will have to move too fast to fool around with time schedules, with planes and buses and trains. You don't have time to drive 2,000 miles in your car, your new when you claim by faith. He's going to transport you. Oh, you say, isn't that a little far out? It's already happening, friends, already happening. I told you, I think a few weeks ago, Valdez, Valdez uh, who asked me, to speak in his church one time up in Minneapolis. How that he told the Lord had revealed to him there's going to be a great increase in saints just being caught away to minister. They'll close their eyes. You better stay shaved up, your hair combed. <laughs> caught away to minister. And he was telling this to his church in Minneapolis, and he said one of his deacons came after, you know, you remember me telling this all white and shaky, and said, Pastor, this isn't going to happen. It's already happened. He said, the other day I knelt down in the bedroom to pray, told my wife's going in there to pray. He said, I felt the floor tremble under me, woke, opened my eyes, and I was off in the middle of Russia somewhere before a group of people like this. And he says, I preached to them for two hours in Russian. He doesn't know a word of it. He said, I didn't understand a word, but I knew it was the word of God. And they were receiving it. And he said, just as I was caught away, I was caught back. Amen. Not going to happen. It's happening in Indonesia. 
Military tells a one woman that God said go over in such and such a province and minister the word. And she was standing on the corner waiting for a bus and closed her eyes to pray and felt the ground tremble, opened her eyes. She was right in the middle of the province that God was going to send her to. Transported bodily. Now, you can't be a Christian and question or have a struggle with that. That isn't strong meat. That isn't the strong meat that Paul's talking about. The strong meat is if God says, I'm going to raise up George Washington tomorrow, and you go around <laughs> calling the people to see it. Because you have the faith to believe it, and you got that faith because you were hearing the deeper word and applying it to your life. And you weren't, you weren't afraid to put the skeptics on the front row. If God says he's going to do something, I'd put the skeptics. I'd be glad to put the skeptics on the front row. Hallelujah. Because God is God. And God can't fail and His Word can't fail. And transported Anna Schrader, who gave me this great prophecy that was the beginning of my ministry of faith nine years ago, there in Dallas, Texas, told how she, it isn't going to happen. Friends, these are just the works, the transportation, the being transported. The greater works and the greater happenings will be great numbers of us frequently caught away. Here and there to minister, and you can get a, a hundred things more done, you see, in a week than you could do in a year by driving and flying and all of that. In preparation, you're going to preach to them in the spirit the language that he gives you. Russian, French, German, Hebrew, Greek, Polish, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, whatever, wherever you're caught to. This brother didn't know a word of Russian. So Anna Schrader, as I say, who gave this great prophecy, which has been unfolding in my life in ministry, tells how that back in the 20s, she was quite a teacher, preacher, evangelist, well respected, you know, by Gordon Lindsay in Pentecostal circles, a prophetess of the Lord, still living, ancient like Anna, told how she was Standing, waiting to go in to minister, the Spirit of the Lord just caught her up over a huge tent from one side to the other and set her down. Why? To demonstrate the power and anointing that was on her. Another time, said, as I preached before them, I just caught up and preached in midair to them before their astonished eyes. Not going to happen, already happened. Those are just the works, you see, the greater works. The eye has not seen, the ear has not heard what God is getting ready to do in protection by the Spirit. Jesus will become invisible. Already happening where he blinds the eyes, you see, of those who would oppress or persecute or kill. To, we could tell you stories about that. In fact, we have, as you well know, how uh, this not going to happen already taking place. Walking on the water, turning the water into wine, already happening. These are not the greater works. These are things Jesus did. Walking on water is what Jesus did. As one brother I've heard say, he said that he knows personally of this evangelist. And of course, some of you can't receive this, but I'm not telling it to you. I'm telling it to those who can receive it. He said this evangelist, before he knew better than to doubt as a child, would walk on the air. The anointing was on him so heavy. The hand of the Lord was with him from birth. God doesn't call prophets when they're 30 or 20 or 50. He said to Jeremiah, I separated you from the womb. If he ever called you into any ministry, he separated you from the womb to that ministry. You just find out about it when you get in God's will and in line with that to be fulfilled in your life. Walked, he said, I walked in midair, walked over the housetops and treetops until I got to be eight or nine years old and, and got too old to, to just believe it. And then I couldn't do it. Amen. And had a tremendous ministry, anointed ministry. But think what would have happened if he'd have kept his faith in that area. And there's times, friends, when you, you wish there was water there to walk on to escape your enemies. Oh, bless your heart. You know, if we were telling you something that... that uh, wasn't already confirmed in the Word, some of you could... Look the way you are. <laughs> but it's already in the Word. I'm just not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to water it down. I'm not going to. 
allow the Spirit to be quenched. I'm not going to be intimidated by the devil or people. Because if you can't handle it, you're in the wrong place tonight. I mean, what are you going to do when it happens? If you don't believe the telling of it, what are you going to do when you see it? Then it'll be too late to say, I wish I would have believed it. Oh, such a great anointing, just like Peter, that when we walk by the sinners and those who are sick, his very shadow healed them. It's in the Bible. Why would you call yourself a Christian when Jesus said, we'll do his works and not expect that to be repeated? Peter did it, and all over God again is revealing these same things, but in tremendous increase in number and degree in the end time. As one sister told me in one of my meetings where I taught regularly, and I brought something like this up. She said, Brother Freeman, just like you're saying it, you're saying it by faith. But she said, I've got it in the Spirit, in vision, tremendous vision that... You're talking about the matured sons of God will go forth and do these works. And God showed me in vision how as we walk down the street, those who have overcome, not charismatics, but overcoming charismatics, as we walk down the street and pass a car parked by the curb filled with the un- unsaved and the lost, she said, if, if our shadow even touches the car, they'll throw open the doors and fall on their knees and repent. There will be such an anointing upon the end-time saints. You see, no Christian can read the book of Acts that, uh, uh, and quarrel with that because they were healed just when Peter's shadow touched them because of the anointing. Another sister said to me in Florida, this is same thing from another source. God, the Lord, appeared to me as a young girl and called me into the ministry said, I'm going to preach. She says, she sings now, but she says, I, this ministry hasn't unfolded, but I believe it like you say. It's going to happen. Please stop your machine at this point and turn the tape over. It's going to happen. And she said, he has shown me in vision, me ministering. And there will be such an anointing, you see, upon me. And this was a confirmation that it would be upon all of those who overcome. But said, such an anointing on me as I would preach the word. I just point to that one and say, be saved. That one, be healed. They fall on their knees and repent. Oh, you see, it's always they repent. You see, some people want to quarrel with the fact, how can you point to someone and be saved? Say, be saved. Well, I think if you read, and you don't have to read between the lines what Paul happened to Paul in Acts 9, you'll see it there. That's far enough, Paul. Paul didn't get up that day and say, I think it would be a nice day to examine the claims of Jesus and see if this is really so. He was persecuting the church on the road to Damascus. Jesus said, that's far enough. Oh, that's what he said. If you don't know he said that, you didn't read all of the ninth chapter. Because he said to Ananias, who was afraid to go lay hands on Paul, that he might receive his sight after he became blind due to the vision of Jesus he saw. And what did he say to Ananias? He is a chosen vessel. Oh, praise God. You're chosen vessels. Some people can't receive the fact they're chosen, but you are. If you're in Christ, you're chosen. Amen. And so that great anointing you see, and will there be such a living word that goes out of our mouths in this greater works ministry that will be thus saith the Lord, and whatever we say immediately comes to pass. You better get in the habit of learning to speak that word of Mark 11:23 now, to rebuke the wind, the fog, the rain, the ice. These elements and to rebuke the fevers and speak the word of faith and watch things to come to pass and tell the pain to go. Because the time's coming for those who learn the deeper faith and the perfect faith when they're whatever they say, it's thus saith the Lord. It's going to happen, come to pass. We do it in our ministry. 
There are people, dear friends, charismatic, spirit-filled, who say they believe the word of God, that the devil with a little bit of the elements could hinder their ministry because they don't have the faith to speak to the fog and say, dissipate, or to the ice or the snow. You have no power over me to go back. God told William Branham that. He said he was up in Colorado on a two-month rest. See, I only took a month. Two-month rest. <laughs> That's what he would minister and then he would go away, get away, and he loved to hunt. And uh, he was up in Colorado with his horse in the mountains, and uh, it was late in the fall, and you know, storms and blizzards come up without any warning. He said he was up there, way up on a mountain, and suddenly a great blizzard swept in on him. And of course, in a matter of minutes, you can't see, you lose all sense of direction. Stood there by a great tree, and he said, The voice of the Lord came to him directly and audibly. Why don't you speak to it like I did? Why don't you rebuke the elements and the blizzard, just as I did the storm? Branham said that great anointing came on him that would come on him when he would minister in the Spirit. And he said, I command you, blizzard, to dissipate and for you winds to go back from whence you came. He said he'd hardly spoken the word till the sun came out, snow disappeared, made his way down the mountain. Got in his car to go back, and I suppose it was in Colorado City where this happened, pulled in a filling station to get gas, and they were all talking about it. They didn't know anything about him, of course, and they couldn't understand it. The miracle that had taken place, they said, you know, the strangest thing has just taken place here recently. They said, whenever a snow, a blizzard starts like that, it lasts at least two days, just heavy snow. And said, in a matter of minutes, it just stopped, disappeared, and the sun came out. We can't understand it. Branham said, I, I could have told him. He spoke the word. You see, what God did through those ministries, these were not the greater works, but he was teaching them and through them, us, and through us, others, that as we now began to speak the word of faith. He told Branham, he said, whatever you say, I will do. And Branham, I've heard him tell this, he could not handle that at first. It was just almost too much. But that's what God says in His Word. Mark eleven twenty three, among other passages. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, You are to say it, be thou removed and cast in the sea, and not doubt in his heart. Believe those things which he says shall come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. Of course, being a hunter and an outdoorsman, he said, All right, Lord, I command in Jesus' name, three white squirrels. There were no white squirrels in the area. Impossible, and no squirrels that time of year where he was. One at a time to come out on the limb, and I'll hit every one of them with my rifle. Immediately, one white squirrel appeared. Shot it, fell down. Immediately, another white squirrel appeared. Shot it, fell down. Immediately, a third white squirrel appeared. Shot it, and it fell down. Now, he didn't ask for God, you know, to give him a new Cadillac or to raise the dead. God said, whatever you say. And to Branham, an uneducated, humble man, this was what he would, this is what makes it authentic. That's what he would ask for. Three squirrels. White ones where there were no squirrels. Because he'd been hunting all day, and you don't find the white ones where he was anyway, and he hadn't seen a squirrel the whole day. But the point is, dear friends, that the anointed word will be a living word, and when we speak it, you see it's going to come to pass. We won't have to guess and wait and hope. It'll be there, and the salvation of souls under this great anointed ministry, this end time, greater works ministry, will be nothing to compare to what you've seen in the book of Acts, or the New Testament, or history, or this dispensation, where God promised old Roberts ten million souls in twenty years, and... God has given them to ten million saved. That doesn't say anything of the thousands healed and so forth. One man, ten million, but that is nothing to what God is going to do through the end time saints. You see, the harvest, Jesus said, is at the end of the age. Revelation 7 tells us that even out of tribulation there will be an innumerable host saved. They're not going to get saved just because they decided to believe. Somebody's going to... See that they get that anointed word. And it'll come in such power, such a demonstration of spirit and power, an innumerable multitude say. That means you can't count them. How many would that be? More than you can count. So the word of God is to come to you in power and in the spirit to prepare you for that ministry. That's why we labor in the word, to prepare you for that. 
not to entertain you and, and try to keep you happy and uh, so forth until you die and go to heaven. We're preparing the untimed body through this ministry here, through the literature, through the tapes for this greater works ministry, for the perfect faith ministry. This word you get week after week is to show you, teach you what faith is and how to appropriate the promises of God. There's no one here that has a mature faith. Very, very few people have what we could call a mature faith. There isn't a person alive that has a perfect faith, and we're going to come into the realm of perfect faith. Amen. That faith described in Mark 11, 22 to 24 is perfect faith. Whatever we speak will happen. Whatever we pray, we receive. Mark 11, 22 to 24. Some people say, what do you mean by perfect faith? Well, I cite it several times a week here. Mark 11, 22 to 24 is perfect faith. That what you speak happens, what you pray, you receive. Mark 11, 22 to 24. But there's no one at this present time that has the kind of faith that's pleasing to God, the kind of faith that he wants us to have. Not even your charismatic leaders and teachers and ministers for the most part. Many of whom don't believe it's always God's will to heal the sick or that there are no exceptions to the promises of God. Many of whom go to the doctors themselves and make excuses for their glasses. Charismatic ministers. But God is preparing us now through the word, through the anointed word, for the realm of perfect faith that we're going to walk in. And as you hear these promises and you hear these messages, you're not to just to stay with that, but that's to be an introduction, a step to go higher. Higher and higher into the realm of faith, the perfect faith that God wants you to have. But God is preparing us. Take any of the promises you see that we give you. We stress Matthew 18, 19 here because, you see, we've got to get Christians to start believing God somewhere. And Matthew 18, 19 is a good place to start for most Christians where two are agreed. As touching anything they ask, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. You see, you have to begin to appropriate that promise at your present level of faith. And when you can prove yourself here and see that God will do what he says on your faith and the person you agree with, then you can move into that higher realm of living and faith and greater works that he wants you to have. You see, uh, for us to come into the maturity of faith, we're going to have to move beyond Pentecost. And the only way you can do that is to get the deeper word. Start applying what you're hearing. Jesus informs you in Mark 11, 22 to 24, that the accomplishment of the greater works depends on what you say and what you pray. Amen. Depends on your faith. He said you can have whatever you say, you can have whatever you pray if you believe it. Now, if Jesus said it, let's believe it. Some of us here do believe it. Amen. Let's believe it if he said it. And you see, your confession of faith has to be a confession of what he said he will do. And the only way you'll know what he said he will do is the word. Faith cometh by hearing the word. That's why we stress it. Why we're starting the charismatic school. There's no substitute for the Word, knowing the Word, knowing what God said, not what man said about it, but what the Word says. You see, faith comes by hearing the Word. That's how you're going to get the perfect faith, hearing the Word. I read somewhere a long time ago how a spirit-filled brother was over in Palestine sitting by the Sea of Galilee, and as he looked across the Sea of Galilee, saw, saw Mount Gilead over there. This is where Elijah, the prophet, the great prophet of faith, came from. He was sitting there meditating, wondering why in the world we don't see that kind of faith today. And as he was meditating, in his heart, a stranger walked up. He thought he was a man, began to converse with him. But he sat down and began to tell him all the thoughts of his heart, told him what he was thinking about, said, you were meditating on this and that, and how that Elijah came over there from Gilead, over to this side, and... Ah, uh, he was a prophet of such great faith, you were wondering why that we don't have that kind of faith today. He said, my son, you get, Elijah got his faith the same place you get yours, from the Word of God. Amen. Elijah had to believe the Word that came to him. Faith comes by hearing the Word. You know why you pray and don't get answers? You know why you claim this or that and don't get an answer sometimes? It's because you're not believing the Word, you're believing what you think is the Word. This is why the teaching is essential. Because many times you're claiming confessing what man has said. You're confessing even though you don't know you are. You're confessing some of the old dead denominational Baptist doctrine. Or Lutheran doctrine. Or Methodist. 
Now, I'm as guilty as that as, as anybody. In fact, I learned it the hard way that you can confess what you think is the Word of God and then get the Holy Ghost and find out you were confessing man's teachings. I had this kidney condition back years ago. Had it past tense, you notice? Went to the doctors, the specialists. They tried every way in the world to find out what was wrong for two solid years, 24 hours a day. I suffered pain. They couldn't figure it out because they couldn't find anything wrong with me. I, I was bleeding. Uh, I had uh, kidney problems. They couldn't find anything wrong with me. I took all kinds of medicine. I took medicine until I got tired of taking medicine. That was the days before the knowledge of divine healing, of course, my Baptist pastor days. And so I just said, well, of course, I didn't know any Baptists who believed in healing, but I said, Lord, I'm tired of taking medicine, going to specialists, being cystoscope. That's painful. That's terrible. And all of that. I said, I'm just going to trust you as best to know how to heal me. And I turned over to 2 Corinthians 12. I should have never gotten there, but that's about all Baptists know about healing Paul's thorn. I said, Lord, if, if <laughs> and that killed it, if it's your will, heal me. If not, give me the grace to bear it. And I really, because that's what Paul... Now, of course, I thought then Paul's thorn was sickness. We won't get into that tonight. We've got a tape on it. Paul's thorn, Job's boils, Epaphroditus' sickness. That will discuss the whole question. But the point was, I didn't know any better then. I thought I was confessing Scripture to God, right in line with His will. It was not until after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit did I discover I wasn't quoting Scripture to God. I was quoting my Baptist doctrine. That's why I wasn't healed. That's why I wasn't healed. I was down in Kokomo a few years ago, teaching on faith. I'd already been there before, and uh, the brother that I'm going to tell you about, he'd heard me before. But this particular night, I do remember saying, under the anointing of the Lord, if you pray ten times for the same promise, you prayed nine times in unbelief. I just happened to look over and catch his eye when I said it, and up to that time, he was with me, and I lost him there. And it just kind of slipped out of me. I said, well, I lost some of you there, didn't I? And from that point on, he didn't smile. He looked like he could have bite ten penny nails in two. And I'd no, <laughs> I'd no sooner said amen. He was a pastor. No sooner said amen till he made his way up to the pulpit. He said, now you said, and he was mad. You say if you pray ten times for the same promise, you prayed nine times in unbelief. Now that's simple logic. If you believed you received the first time, you see, why did you pray ten times? Jesus said, all things you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Jesus said, when you pray, believe you have received, and you shall have it. If you believe you have received. So that was the basis. I was teaching that. That's, and then I said the ten and the nine. Why well, you said Jesus prayed three times in the garden? And even prayed, if it be thy will. Now I said, now brother, first of all, Jesus wasn't praying about any promise there in the garden. Secondly, he wasn't teaching us how to pray the prayer of faith there in the garden. He's wrestling with the cross. Now I said, in the third place, Jesus isn't going to contradict himself. He, not Hobart Freeman, said, Matthew 6, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do because they think they're going to be heard for their much praying. Amen. Jesus said, when you pray, believe you have received and you shall have it. Now, I said, Jesus isn't going to contradict himself. I'm talking about the promises of God. It's so easy to forget what you stress over and over. We're not talking about when you don't know God's will. Pray, if it be thy will, when you don't know his will. Better pray for a revelation of his will. Then you can pray the prayer of faith. We're talking about the promises. You're supposed to be knowing his will 95% of your Christian life. You're not supposed to be running around in a daze, bewildered and confused. That's the world. That's the denominational church. You're supposed to be in the Word and knowing what His will is. You're supposed to know the prayer of faith heals the sick. My God will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory. And so, you see, without a knowledge of God's Word, a deeper knowledge of God's Word, he had a knowledge of the Word. He knew where Jesus was in the garden praying. He was a pastor. He'd preach messages out of the Bible. It wasn't that he didn't have the Word, but he didn't have the deeper Word. He even had the Spirit, the baptism. But didn't have the deeper word, and therefore he couldn't put it together. Jesus in the garden is all he could see to justify why, you know, that some people he had prayed for hadn't got healed, I suppose. It is an easy way out. It's really a cop-out. The easy way is to just say, you know, that, that Jesus prayed if, so I'll always pray if. That's putting the responsibility back on God, and he's already put it on us. And so to come into perfect faith, we have to get beyond Exodus 15, 26, believing I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's a good place to start. 
But once you've appropriated, by faith, Exodus 15, 26, God doesn't want you to stand there on that promise. He wants you to move on up to, say, Exodus 23, 25. I will take all sickness out of the midst of thee, if you obey me. He promises you both physical and spiritual prosperity, if you obey him. So he doesn't want you to stand still. He wants you to come into mature, perfect faith. Why? So that he can manifest us as his matured sons. That's what he's preparing us for. To bring us into maturity. Now the average charismatic, and we have to face reality, is not ready, not able to receive the deeper revelation that God has for us. That's why he's bringing it forth gradually. A word here, a line there, a little here, a little there, this ministry, that ministry. You're supposed to put it together. You see, because Jesus said, I have much I want to say to you, but you're not able to bear it yet. You see, the ministry he's preparing you for, us for, is going to be a new type ministry. It's not just going to be a repetition of the apostolic ministry. It's going to be that, but much more than that. And so he's gradually preparing us through the deeper word that you get through ministries like this church brings forth. And if you don't believe this is a deeper word, just take any part of it, what you may think is the least, anywhere else. And you'll find out it's a deeper word when you get those big stairs right back at you. They bounce off of you like sound off of the wall. And so when... The, the ministry that he's preparing us for is a gradual preparation. He is preparing us in faith, the word of faith. He's gradually restoring the charismatic gifts to the body. He's restoring the place and importance of prophecy. People, some of you are prophesying who never believed that you would. He is restoring uh, the ministry to the body, body ministry, charismatic body ministry. He is showing us the need of overcoming. <laughs> He is exhorting us to die off to self, be crucified with Christ, so that the resurrection, life, and power of Christ can come forth through us. He's restoring the fivefold ministry. You're seeing the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, the charismatic, God-gifted ministries all over the world being restored. They're happening. You don't have to look forward to find an apostle today or a prophet, and certainly not a teacher. We've got, we've got many teachers going right out of this body every week, and they're going to be more. Amen. Anointed ministries, gifted ministries. He's restoring all of that, getting ready for the great restoration of the new order, divine order. And if you are still satisfied with stopping at Pentecost, if you're still trying to build some little kingdom around your gift or ministry, if you're still uh, easily offended by the word, the deeper word, if you're still stumbling and raising questions and asking and reasoning why, if you're still critical and gossiping and quarrelsome and not submitting to the leadership, you're still under the old order. You won't be ready for the new order that God's preparing us for. You see, the present anointed word ministry, friends, that you are hearing, and we're just telling you like it is, we're not setting ourselves up as anything uh, above any other brother or sister in this end time, but... We know what you're getting, and you know what you're getting, or you wouldn't be enduring it. And it's the present anointed word ministry that's the most important, because by this word you hear week after week, God is separating with that word those who are making just shallow commitment, who are not dying out to self, who do not intend to overcome from those who uh, have already sold out to Jesus and have made total commitment and are going all the way with him. Now, <clears throat> don't be deceived. Most people think God's going to separate us out there in the future. As we prove ourselves, he isn't going to separate us. He's been separating us. Amen. The shallow from the overcomer. In fact, you've already made your choice. You've been here six months. You already know whether you're going on to the deeper things. You already know where you believe all of this message. You already know whether you want to be an overcomer, whether you're satisfied with stopping at Pentecost. God isn't going to divide. He's already separated the shallow from the overcomer. You've already made your choice. And if that shocks some of you into getting home, going home, getting on your knees and saying, Lord, God forbid that I should be left out, then it served its purpose in me saying it. Because God doesn't do the separating. His Word does. You separate yourself in one or two camps. 
Praise God, most of you, I have no doubt. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. I'd be out on the road and seeing you occasionally. I can take this message. They beg you to come all over the world. But I know that most of you are receiving it. And that's why God said, stay here and teach them. Because they are going to be teachers and the ministers and the nucleus that will reach others. The hub of the wheel. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It is true. And it only happens if you believe it. You see, uh, I didn't get some great revelation like a jigsaw puzzle all put together when God called me to this ministry. It came through vision and prophecy, and he said, there it is, believe it or don't believe it. And I decided to believe it, and it all began to unfold. And it's only the beginning. This, this part of it's only the beginning of what God has shown what he's getting ready to do. Tremendous ministry yet to come. But you see, it's the present anointed word ministry that's the most important. You think the greater works ministry is the most important. No, that's going to help the others. For you, the now is the only important thing, is of the greatest, utmost importance. This present word that you hear in this hour, now you're either choosing for or against it. Now you're growing or you're not. Now you're being prepared or you're not. You see, the anointed word ministry prepares you for the deeper word he wants to bring us. And he brings us more and more, you see. I get amused at people sometimes say, Brother Freeman, you sure changed before you're from three or four years ago. It isn't me changing, although I'm changing, but they're changing. The word's changing them. Believe me. <laughs> We're all changing from glory into glory. Praise the Lord. I get amused because I know it's them that's being changed by the Word. Praise the Lord. And they say, you know, oh, brother, you know, but we can understand you now. <laughs> I've had people say that. You know, like I've changed. It's the same Word. They're changing. They're, they've been receiving it. And as you receive it, then he can give you more. God wants to wean you away from that old denominational teaching, man's teaching. Now, what was truth will be there? All of my Baptist studies were not in vain, praise God, or your Methodist or Lutherans' studies. Praise the Lord. Not only do I know it's true, but he showed it in vision. I really did. I thought the Baptist had most of the truth as a Baptist. When I first became charismatic, I knew Methodists and so forth were getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I figured they would come into more truth like I had it, <laughs> until this sister had the vision and said she was praying for God to pour the Spirit out upon the Methodists, and he said, because, he said, I'm going to answer your prayer because of the foundation of truth laid by John and Charles Wesley. I'm going to pour the Spirit out upon the Methodists because of the truth those men had. Wow. That kind of humbles you. <laughs> and I don't mean it self-righteously, but I didn't know they had any truth. <laughs> I, had, I had argued with Methodists, the best of them. And I knew they had the basic truth of salvation of Jesus Christ. I didn't give them credit for much more. I really didn't. Because they were Arminian from the core, which was everything contrary to my Baptist beliefs. And God said, because the truth they laid, the foundation of truth, I'm going to visit the Methodists and the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans. Sweep away like the wind blowing away the chaff. All of men's teachings, traditions, where they've been accumulated over the centuries or recently. He said, there's going to be nothing left but my truth. That time's coming. The present word ministry seeks to wean you away from all that man has taught, man's teaching, Baptist doctrine, Lutheran teaching, Methodist Methodism. You see, the truth that Wesley had is another matter, God said. He didn't mean the Methodists had all the truth. He meant that Wesley laid a foundation of truth. The Reformation out of the Church of England, you see, is what he's talking about. So did Luther lay some truth. 
And so uh, we've got to get, we've got to receive the word at the present level of our faith and act on it before God can give you the deeper word, stronger meat, the deeper, fuller revelation. Some are not ready to receive it. It was reported to me in one of my meetings that so-and-so said that you're going around Freeman. Whenever people disagree with me, they say, Freeman. Freeman. <laughs> In fact, uh, after one message, a man came up and said, I see why you're called Freeman. You are a free man. After, because I pulled out the stoppers. But anyway, Freeman is going around teaching that we are going to do the works of Jesus. And we are going to do greater works. I said, that's exactly right. That's what I'm teaching. And the reason I'm teaching it is because Jesus Christ himself taught it. Amen. Amen. I'm not afraid to say what Jesus said. Now, that man's not ready for deeper revelation because he can't receive what's already revealed and been there 2,000 years. Charismatic can't receive anything else that you might have to tell him because he can't receive what's plainly written in the Word. Friend out there, you can't do anything but John, with John 14, 12 to 14, but believe it and call yourself a Christian. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to know when it's going to happen, but you have to believe it. He said, he that believes on me will do my works. And if you're not doing these works, then you better call into question your belief. And you start with getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then you'll see why you couldn't believe it. Start with his works. We've been doing his works in this church for almost nine years. We're waiting for the greater works. So people, a lot of them, are not ready for the deeper revelation. That's what the anointed word ministry is for to prepare us for that. This is the most important stage. Well, you can mention the manifestation of the sons of God in the average charismatic circle and frighten most of them out of the room. Oh, they're afraid of it. Just because some have misperverted the scriptures on this truth. But Romans 8 still in the Bible. I don't care if some are denying the resurrection, saying we're being resurrected now in the Spirit. I don't care if some are saying that Christ isn't going to literally appear, that we are the clouds and He's appearing in us now, that the clouds of glory is going to appear in. I don't care because some have gone to extreme. I care because they have, but I'm not going to let that hinder my believing the plain teaching and word of God that Romans 8 says that all creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And they cannot be manifested until they're the matured sons of God. They're the ones that will be caught up and changed and brought back to ministry. Oh, there will be ministry before they're caught up. There will be great works done. But the greater works ministry is out there when they're changed. When their word is thus saith the Lord, when they speak a word, the foundations of hell will tremble just at your word. Amen. Be saved, and he falls on his knees and repent. Be healed, and healed instantly. doesn't have to feel around to just happen. God is showing it by his spirit. These are the greater works. Some people are not ready for that. You mentioned... Being transported, walking on water, turning water into wine, mending a broken bone supernaturally. They think you're daydreaming. And it's already happening, these things. I've got news for you, friends. If you haven't heard the message of the manifestation of the sons of God as the Bible teaches it, then you'll never be manifested. God will never manifest any son who doesn't believe like a son, who doesn't believe in his manifestation, who doesn't walk like a son who doesn't talk like a son. But for those of us who know that it's going to happen, that it's in the process of happening, it's already taking place in us because God is now working in us by the Spirit, changing us from glory into glory. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are now being changed from glory into glory. The image of Christ is going to come forth in us so when they look at us, they see Christ. It will be Christ that doesn't take the place of his second advent, as some are erroneously teaching. But we will go forth in the power, the demonstration of spirit and power of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. But he's going to manifest no one is not preparing for it. God is going to separate you, dear friend. This is a strong word tonight. He's going to separate you from this end time body that he's preparing if you don't settle the question quickly. You've been sitting under a ministry like this for six, 
eight, ten months, that change is already taking place. And if it isn't, it isn't likely it ever will. You've already made your choice. God help you to make the right one. In this hour, if this is the first time you've heard, you've got a choice that you have to make. The baptism isn't the choice. The baptism is the preparation to make the right choice. It's Galatians 2.20. It's 200 pages, Deeper Life in the Spirit book, for those of you who may need to re-examine what's on your shelf or get it if you don't have it. Tells you what God is getting ready to do. What He's already in the process of doing. He's already changing us. We've already been birthed into that realm. We are just waiting for the manifestation of the promises of God on behalf of the end time saints that God has been preparing us for from the foundation of the world. Somebody had to be this end time generation. Praise God. We can say in all humility, but praise God, we're it. And if you don't know we're it, then it's because you don't know the Word. Because the Word of God tells you how you can know we're it. He says there will be a group of saints, First Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, at the end of the age, it will not taste of death, they'll be changed. Now don't go out and say what I didn't say, but you can say what I said. And if you know the Word of God, when He said in Luke 21 of countless prophecies already fulfilled and in the process of fulfillment, when you see Jerusalem restored to the Jews, that generation will not pass away until all is fulfilled. It's already happened. happened in 67. He said in the latter days, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. If that isn't happening, I don't know what the latter days would be called. Every one of you, former Baptist, Methodist, Nazarenes, Presbyterians, Catholics, whatever you were, know that it's happened. Because you've had, you've had the experience. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to prepare our hearts to receive the deeper word of life. A word that is coming forth in this hour that no other generation has been privileged to hear. To participate in. There has been no time in history outside the day of Pentecost when tens of thousands, yea, millions of Christians all over the world are being baptized in the Spirit, learning that God is God, that there's a real spiritual dimension that they can move into now by faith. They can do now, begin to do the works of Jesus in preparation for the works ahead. God grant that every heart, every mind, will be fully yielded unto Thee in this hour. Oh, God forbid that there should be a single one who sits under this ministry that should be content and satisfied with the status quo, not going beyond Pentecost, but being settled on their lees, content to have an experience to talk about. But, Lord, move upon them by the Spirit in this hour. Move upon them in such a way that there not be a single man, woman, boy, or girl who does not open his heart and mind fully to Thee, saying, Lord, enable me by Your grace to receive all that You have for me. And whatever my place and work is in this end time, where You place me as it pleases You in the body of Christ, Open my eyes and anoint my body, mind, soul, and spirit to fulfill this place in ministry in Jesus' name. God grant that they will ask this and pray this in all sincerity. We ask it in the mighty name of him who said if we ask anything in his name, he will do it, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah.